Hi, and welcome to the October update from Dean Park. I have loads to update you on this month, which includes significant scenic work in front of the Great Wall. I introduced O-Gage to the Dean Park collection, a massive new scratch build at the west end of the layout, and finally, some new double O-Gage models join the Dean Park collection. If you have any feedback, please post that in the comments section below. And don't forget to give this video a like and also subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. In the meantime, enjoy the video. The time has come for me now to add some scenic material along the upper section at the back of the wall and down at the front of the wall at the lower section. For this I'll have to remove the, the walling so I can get good access to the, the upper section here. I'll just be adding in some um, earth tones, some low-lying weeds and, and coarse turf along with maybe the odd patch of static grass and lineside muck and debris. In the next few clips I'll show you me progressing along this side and I'll show you the materials that I'm using along the way. In previous few clips you'll have seen me add some ground cover, including earth scatters, then some different grades of the ballast, and also some coarse turfs. Most of these are from Woodland Scenics. In the next series of clips I'm going to add in tufts of static grass, and I'm really looking for the, the same effect as this part of Lineside, and it will vary as it goes along with different patches of grass, and I'll add in some low bush and ground cover um, at a later date as well once the static grass has dried. So I'm going to get the static grass applicator out and I'll show you how to do that and hopefully that'll start to add a bit of depth to the actual line side.
As you'll have seen in the previous clips, I had papered down where I didn't want the static grass to go all over. I've then basically taken the um, static grass on that paper and poured it back into my tub so I can reuse it. In the next clip, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my vacuum attachment and I'm going to put a thin sports sock over the end, um, courtesy of my wife. And what that'll do is allow the air to pass through it, but collect all the static grass that isn't fixed to the layout. Again, allowing me to use it in future projects. Static grass, etc., is expensive enough, so we don't really want to be wasting it if we can uh, get away with it. That's me vacuumed up the excess now. What I'll do is I'll wait for the PVA to totally dry before taking the vacuum across it again, this time without the protective sock, just to get off any loose fibres that are in the actual tufts. We don't want static grass fibres getting into our locomotive um, mechanisms, not at the price obviously in models these days, you don't want them breaking them. So it is important to vacuum off any excess from the track area. This is the kind of patchy nature that I wanted. However, what I'm going to do now is put some little dots of PVA and put some lighter tufts of grass of varying colours into the mix, just to give it a bit of variation. I've also not ruled out using some Woodland Scenics underbrush and bushes, just to kind of blend in the area, as I've got around the curve there behind the Signal and Telecommunications Centre. This old gauge model of a Hurst Nelson 12 tonne 7 plant coal wagon was produced exclusively for Scooney Hobbies in Kirkcaldy by Daypol. It was one of a very limited edition of 48 models produced. At the time of recording, there's less than a dozen of these remaining, having only been released at the very end of October. You might be asking what I'm doing with an old gauged item. After all, Dean Park is purely double old gauge. Well, I've actually been eyeing up some old gauge items for some time now as the prices of the double O-gauge locos are creeping ever nearer their O-gauged cousins. This larger scale now looks more appealing as the months go on. Coupled to that, the stunning class 37s and 56s from Hellyan, and you never know what lies ahead, I may just take the plunge. However, panic not, I have no intentions of moving away from double O-gauge, as there's still much to do in the layout, and I'm sure dozens of more locos to collect. I'm also sure Steve at Scooney Hobbies, with his uniquely tasting coffee, will persuade me to buy a few more models as well. I did, however, have to get one of these Weems wagons. Weems was a major producer of coal from the turn of the 19th century until coal nationalisation in 1947, which saw Weems Coal incorporated into the newly formed National Coal Board, or NCB. This wagon was built by Hurst Nelson & Company Limited of Motherwell in 1934 and operated for many years. Many examples like this were seen well into the 1960s, such was their solid design and robust construction. The model carries the familiar Weems coal maroon with blackened bracing and corner brackets. Dapel have done an excellent job of capturing the planking and rivet work of this wagon, as well as an accurate representation of the underframe, including leaf suspension. Sprung buffers and coupling chains are also fitted at each end. The model is in pristine condition and have no intention of running this wagon, for now at least. It's a purely collector's item, as being a fifer, Weems and the estate is part of my local heritage. I have to commend Daypol on making such a lovely model and for Steve at Scooney Hobbies for commissioning such an important historic wagon. The type of ground cover I'm going to go for here is a mixture of postcrete and this kind of builder's aggregate sand, it's not builder's sand because it's got too many um, pebbles and, and stones in it, which obviously be sieved out anyway. But I feel a mix of these two will give me the shade that I'm after for the base of the wall. What I did was I've played about on this kind of test bed with different materials for the ground cover. Um, and I've basically gone from just pure postcrete, which is very grey, post creek with some uh, coarse turf and fine turfs sprinkled on. I've gone for sand, which I feel is too red for this particular instance. I've then gone for a kind of mixture of the sand and the, the post creek. Now, when I put it on a smaller piece, 
Again, I've played around with different, as you can see, different um, finishes or ground cover. I like the one along the end here, which has got a mixture of the, the sand, the postcrete, fine scatters, a bit of coarse turf, and some ballast sprinkled on top. Now, the ballast will be mainly near the line side area and not right up against the wall. But when I take the airbrush across this later on with, say, um, some sleeper grime, it will tone it down even further. I feel that's a kind of... Um, combination that I would I would like to see at the bottom of the wall. What I've got actually is a, a scrap wall and I just put the, the actual um, bit of wood under the bottom there just to see what kind of effect I'm going to get and then I decide obviously on um, what one to go for. So I like to do these little test parts and even lay them next to the layout to give me an idea of what it's going to look like once it's been put in position. The kind of tone that I'm looking for is a 60-40 mix, roughly, 60% um, of this sand. I actually found this in my shed yesterday, a 20 kilogram bag I've had for I don't know how many years, and I got that from Juicen's Builder and Timber Yard, um, and I've obviously got my, my post crete here. 60% to 40%, roughly, to get the shade I want. I'm then going to sieve it onto um, PVA, that will be placed on the layout, and the wall, you'll notice, has been removed for this phase. That's so I can get right into the bottom where the wall will be um, and the wall just gets in the way, to be honest. And you don't want um, post-creep dust getting all over your, your nice uh, structures as well. It's, yes, you can brush and hoover it off, but it, it tends to get right into the, the texture of the MDF, so I'm trying to avoid that. So uh, that's why I've removed the walls while I do that. That's the scenic cement now dried. It took just over maybe, what, 12 to 15 hours to fully dry. I really am happy with the appearance I've got now. I've got a mix of the earthy tones due to the postcrete and sand mix, along with the Woodland Scenic's fine earth scatter. The coarse turfs give that kind of low-lying, mossy weed appearance that I'm after. I will be adding some bushes in the following clips and some buddleii. I'm not going to go heavy on the static grasses here, I want a bit of a varied look from other parts of the, the layout.
I've not only been a busy bee in the last month, I've also become a bankrupt bee um, because all the pre-orders that I've had are starting to flow through, such as the, the Swallow liveried Mark IVs from Hornby, the Speedlink wagons from Backman, and also Kerno announced and released another Kerno exclusive Backman product. This time the um, Class 37 37012 Loch Ranach, and I've got one here in deluxe trim. So I'll have a look at these three models a little bit closer. This latest Kerno exclusive in partnership with Backman um, really did catch my eye from the off. It's a Scottish Class 37 and it's got the Halford headlight on the front. And being a split box 37, I really couldn't resist. I, I did resist for a while. Um, obviously the price point is a massive issue for me. Um, £370, it's, you know, it's getting to the point where um, these things are becoming really luxury items but you know I didn't get the previous release from Backman in this particular livery so when it came along again albeit in the deluxe trim I uh, I put up a fight as I said but I couldn't resist in the end. The model that's been presented by Kerno dates this model up to around 1986 which is obviously ideal for my uh, particular era. I like the way that the, the dark grey roof um, suits this model and in particular the way they've left the yellow stripe along the top in place of the usual orange cantrail stripe. Being around the mid 1980s it has yet to receive its um, um, calf nose aerial which I like on the class 37s but I also like to have them um, predating that as this particular model shows. Small little details on the model impress the, the silver the threshold kick plate at the door there exquisitely picked out in painted silver we've got the finesse of the new roof grill which really does impress me and just the way that the model is presented you know the sharp edges between the paint and as I said the grey roof really does suit this particular livery I'm not usually a fan of red buffer beams on locos especially when they're not weathered but this one particularly um, does suit the class 37 the way they presented the buffers as well, the buffers themselves are silver but the faces of the buffers are black and round the edge of the buffer is the silver lining. Um, that really is an exquisite piece of printing and they're flawless on all corners of the model. You can't beat a Scottish Class 37, especially if it's got a West Highland Terrier on the side. That really does set it off for me and the Scottish names that these locals carried, in this case Loch Rannoch, a lot of people pronounce it as Loch, it's actually Loch, you've got to let your kind of tongue roll on that one. Um, a lot of non-Scots people uh, struggle with that word. So yeah, Loch Rannoch is um, you know, a pretty famous and well-known local of the era and I'm glad to add it to the collection. Hopefully this will sit nicely with my forthcoming Acura scale class 37 zeros um, with the Halford headlight. I do like a split box 37, I think it really does suit this particular local. I'm not afraid to mix and match classes with regard to my collection of locals so as I said hopefully the, the Backman and the Acura scale one will sit perfectly side by side. Being a deluxe model from Backman you obviously got the sound, the rotating um, roof fan and also the deluxe glazing. You're not maybe picking up the deluxe glazing from this particular angle but it does actually um, give a striking look when the light hits it. I did a full review on the new Backman Class 37 and I'll put the link to that at the top of the screen and at the end of the video.
One of Backman's latest releases are these BR VGA vans in the um, Red Rail Freight Speedlink livery. Whilst not a new model from Backman, I think this is the third release of these uh, particular wagons, um, and the code for this is 37601C. They are an effective model, um, they're priced around £30 each, and they will complement my Speedlink services, including the, the rail freight box fans um, just behind them there. I'll be getting them weathered at some point um, to tone them down, they're far too clean as they are. They are a good running wagon, they're a bit basic in terms of the kind of technology that they've used underneath here. If you look at the, the coupler mechanism with this small plastic um, rod, if you like, helps it spring back into the centre position. It's basic but effective. Um, under frame detail is, well, yeah, pretty basic. Um, the van itself is well finished in this silvery grey colour and all of the printing is first class, as you'd expect from Backman. I've got three of these in the collection. Um, I might add more at a later date, but yeah, I'm pleased to finally get them on the layout. Earlier in the year, I got myself a rake of the brand new Hornby Mark IVs in GNER livery, and I've also got a complete set in LNER livery. The last ones that interest me to appear are these Intercity Swallow um, liveried ones, which are bang on era for the Dean Park layout, arriving at the later parts of the, the era that I model in 1989 and 1990. This is Coach A, the, the coach that ran directly behind the Class 91 locomotive, and you can tell that by the, the blunt end there without the, the gangways, and it's also been fitted with buffers, the only end of the entire Mark IV stock that indeed has any buffers on it. Hornby have released six out of the eight coaches in this livery, and I imagine the last two coaches won't be far away. I'll then be able to finally get my 8 car with a DVT and Class 91 running at Dean Park. Um, the layout, as I said earlier in the year, was really designed for running um, HSTs and Class 91s in this livery. Um, so finally, um, as, a, as the layout approaches its 10th year, I'll finally have the, the train that it was designed for. On the subject of my layout, um, as I said, it's coming up for its 10th anniversary at the end of the year. And keep an eye out for something special happening then. As you can see, I've now got the retaining wall lowered into position. Um, it follows the, the outer rail and is pretty much parallel to that outer rail all the way around the curve. It's made up of separate sections of embossed brickwork on a continuous 2mm MDF backing. Where the joins are in the brick embossed sheet will be the vertical buttresses. Hopefully this will give you an idea how the upper baseboard will tie in with the embankment and the tops of these walls as they're stepped up and round to the side. This area here, the gap, will be 
um, all boxed in with scenic material to blend it in to the bottom of the wall. If you're still watching by this point, thanks very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed seeing the, the scenic area come to life around about the wall section. It's not finished yet, I'll be adding some low-lying bushes, patches of static grass and some buddly eye weeds as well, and that'll come in the next update. In the meantime, thanks for watching, happy modelling and cheers for now.